Hello there, I'm James, and if you're new here, then I'm a completionist-based channel that's been primarily focused on Ark Survival Evolved and all of its DLC. But along with that, we've also focused on making a playlist of all of the Ark Survival Evolved lore over the last year or so. And with the release of Genesis Part 2, Wildcard has decided to give us the lore once again in the form of the Explorer Notes. And today we're going to begin Santiago's note read-through. At the beginning of this month I did a little mini-series on unlocking all of the exosuit skins. And if you've seen episode 4 you'll know that there is some new lore for Santiago. So if you haven't already seen that then go back and check that one out. Because it just expands a little bit more on when he lands on planet Earth and when he leaves Aberration. Those of you familiar with the story of Ark will know that Santiago dies, and if you've played Extinction, you may have noticed his gravestone in the back of Sanctuary City. So as we've always done, we'll stick with the same format, and we'll break these 30 notes into two segments. So sit back, relax, and enjoy part one of the notes from Santiago on Genesis. Really, really hate these neural uplinks. Last thing I need is a record of all my unconscious thoughts. Guess I better review all my entries before committing. Okay, okay, begin. So here I am, on the site for Genesis. Led my share of teams before, but this project is... Yeah. How do I describe an attempt to recreate everything and everyone that ever lived on Earth? This one's so big, it's got the feds working with the URE. Damn, that probably sounded sarcastic. Whoever's accessing this, I know how important this project is. How serious things are. We've barely got time to cram our message in a bottle and pitch it overboard before the end. It shouldn't come as a shock that both sides of the element war could team up in the face of a global extinction event. Just never thought I'd see it. What made me think I could help lead this project? Sure. I'd only had an overview of what they were trying to do here, but you'd have to get a light year away to start taking it all in. I've been trying to catch up to speed by scrolling through all their documentation, and it's making me wish I had Uma's process in power. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, I'm working for one of them now, a transhuman named Uma. If only the me over a decade ago could see me now. I know we've all supposedly been at peace for years, but it's still sort of hard to take in how fast things have changed. I mean it. I can barely remember how I ended up where I am now, working for people who were trying to kill me not so long ago. It took this long for the stubborn bastards running the Turan Federation to accept what their enemy was trying to tell them, that our planet is terminally ill. The evidence must have been damn convincing for them to let the transhumans help us with our gateway plan. The scale of this thing, I don't know. I keep getting caught in spirals, trying to picture all the variables for when I start making decisions around here. How do you even start a list of essential items you need to make a backup of nature? What do you pack to relocate to another planet? I mean, we barely got far enough into the dark to bring back evidence of alien life to argue about. A few amino acids, traces of something like chlorophyll, nothing like definitive proof we're not the only show in town. If we'd found that proof, I wouldn't have to feel like it's on me to save the only things that ever looked up and thought about those lights in the sky. Ah, <sighs> I guess our transhumanist friends would argue differently. Sorry, never been superstitious or religious, whatever the term should be. I'd, uh, better search the right term before uploading this. At first, transhumanism seemed like a mirror version of all those old timely crystal healing nuts who rejected modern medicine wackos grooving on the energies of the miracle discovery powering all of our shiny tech junk. Used to think I was just as big on tech, back when I was hacking media feeds and jailbreaking police bots in the fabulous. But when they started with all their brain modification and neuroprosthetics, I stopped understanding them. Not that I agreed with the Fed crackdown. If someone wanted to disappear up their own interface port and commune with the infinite, I figured that was their business. Who'd have thought we'd all end up going to war over that bullshit? My project partner Uma would say that Element's proof of a higher power out there somewhere, trying to help us reach it. If it really was a sacred gift from the stars, we've wasted it burning down our own home around us. Hell, I personally designed weapons powered by that stuff. Uma's been after me to choose some team leaders. 
so I've been scanning her shortlist for standouts. Alicia's thesis work, Environmental Transport of Energetic Compounds, jumped out at me. It keeps me up at night knowing I design munitions that permanently poison battlefields. So I'd love to promote someone to central planning who understands how to keep element junk from polluting our biomes. Her high-level military clearance with the Tehran Federation doesn't hurt either. I'd feel better with that whiz kid Yunki running our Ingram reconstruction project too. He's a humanist zealot, so I think it's safe to assume his genius is all natural and not from enhancement. Nothing against Uma or the rest of them, but I'd rather a regular human building our brain bank. Yeah, better hold this upload. In fact, keep my journal local only going forward, unless I say it's okay to commit any new entries. Even the name of this project bugs me, if I'm being honest. Genesis. Sounds like what someone with delusions of godhood would call it, just begging for the same kind of fear and hate transhumanists got. Once they started evangelizing us to heathens, this goes public and we'll have mobs organizing to shut us down. People didn't react well when they found out their ancestors' bones had been dug up and gene sequenced by researchers with no cultural sensitivity. What happens when it gets out we want to build an archive of everyone who ever lived on Earth? I've been trying to understand the transhumanist mindset because something occurred to me. If you want this project to work out, we need to convert zealots of our own to the cause. True believers who'll raise their kids to believe. How else will we convince people to give up lifetimes? Their children's lifetimes for this pipe dream. It's like we're laying the foundation for a cathedral so our distant descendants can pray in it. By the time that day comes, this plan to restart life on earth or elsewhere could be the last religion left around. I'm sure I'll never live to see the launch of any interstellar colony ship or satellite arc swarm, whichever ends up being our final choice for relocating our archive. So I need to make sure this project is set up for the future, with people dedicated to seeing it through no matter what it takes. I've been stuck for weeks with our Vivarium team, trying to get them to reach a consensus on ecosystem inclusion. What's the least amount of terrestrial life forms you'd need to recreate nature? If all you had left were humans, chickens, honeybees, catfish, algae, alfalfa, yeast and some pinto beans, could you say you'd save life on Earth? We don't honestly expect to be able to preserve every form of life that ever existed, but it only seems smart to back up as much as possible, extinct or otherwise, in case there's a possible balance that we've missed out on the first time. What if pterosaurs were still around when hominids started domesticated animals? Maybe that could have led to a civilization better equipped to survive eco-disasters. That's the same approach our antecedent group is using to archive every human mind and body that ever lived. Say things didn't work out well for some warrior queen. What if she'd been born with better eyesight? Or a stronger immune system? What if she had a pet mammoth? I finally realised the only way to solve our deadlock over biome conservation was to ask Yunki to model variations for us in the Genesis engine. I knew there'd be a cost to running his team ragged to get us rough simulations way ahead of schedule, but that's nothing compared to the cost of building physical versions. His sims will let us rule out the more extreme suggestions and find a balance of habitats almost everyone can agree on. I'd probably still be nursing a migraine while experts screamed at each other if Yunki's team wasn't pulling off the impossible. I really owe that kid. Even in early development, his sims are really immersive. You can see the potential for training colonists while they're still in hibernation. Ideally, they'll wake up with all the skills necessary to hit the ground running on their new home planet. Uma actually seemed glad to see me back in the office again this morning. She'd asked if I'd give her a full situation report on our biome decisions over dinner. I was only too happy to cut out early for a fancy meal. Figured I'd earn that much, breaking up those arguments over name toad diversity. Uma even grinned when I shared my pain over ancho rubbed ribeyes and merlot. Hadn't even been sure one of them could smile, so that felt like a win. I spotted Yunki drinking by himself at the bar. I called him over and asked if they'd solved their perpetual foregrounding problem. The kid seemed jittery around us. He'd been working with the transhumans longer than me, so what was that about? Couldn't tell if Uma didn't notice him squirming was too polite to say anything about it or didn't care either way. You know what? I better follow up on this.
Yunki kept acting weird all day. Once I caught on that he was ducking me, I tried to put myself in places where we'd have to cross paths. When we did, he kept conversations so professional that I felt like he was messing with me. Whiz kids like him can be twitchy. I thought maybe I just couldn't read him any more than I can guess what kind of complicated data crunching Uma's is doing at any given time. So I opted for the direct approach and said he'd hurt my feelings. And just when I thought we had a good vibe going, that got him to laugh and loosen up a little bit. So I offered to buy him a round at the canteen to build on that. A few pints later, I had him sharing pics of his husband and his kids. Never would have figured a young guy like Yunki for a family man. I thought about all the all-nighters he'd been putting in and pulled rank to order him home for a few days. Well, Yunki made me regret pushing him to share what the deal was with me. Don't know what I expected, but it sure wasn't some conspiracy theory about my background. I could see the kid was still on edge even after the time off with his family, so I dragged him back to the canteen for another one-on-one. -on -one. He only took a couple of rounds of shots for him to open up. First, he told me he'd heard a rumour that I'd been killed near the end of the war. Then he admitted trying to access my personal file for proof of life, only to find himself locked out. Even though he admitted crossing a serious line, I laughed it off and pointed out that I was sitting right there next to him. I stopped laughing when he told me he found a listing for my engram in the archive that was non-accessible, even at his security level. That was news to me. I know the kid had no business trying to peek at my personal file, but I get why a true believer like Yunki would have a hard time trusting his former enemies. Maybe I understand his paranoia a little too well. I'm no patriot, but it's hard to let go of all that wartime propaganda about transhumans wanting to make us into hosts for some invasive hive mind. I wanted to prove Yunki wrong, but when I brought up my own file, I got stuck on the part where it summed up my post-war activities. Pretty much everything I said I did just before joining Genesis felt wrong. Then I realised that my own service record didn't sit right with me. Sure, I remembered things my record said I did near the end of the war, but I didn't feel anything about those memories one way or the other. I don't like the implications of that. After I looked up my own record last night and freaked out, I tried to cover my tracks with a few hours of random searches through the database. I stumbled across the first major screw-up by Yunki's division. Between emulating and archiving, they somehow got two distinct historical identities entangled. The dominant personality, a gold prospector from Alta California, was also given the memories of an Alexandrian occultist from the Roman Principate. I tie up the resources to unravel and recompile them, so I flag the whole mess to fix if or when we ever have any downtime. Meshing up two sets of genetics would give us new offspring that never organically happened, but this was like stitching a random pair of souls together. Hope my warning flags keeps this poor bastard from ever getting incarnated. I can't picture an AI ever glitching out enough to resurrect an aberrant Ingram. This one's legitimately going to haunt me though. Honestly wish I could just erase me from ever knowing about it. Yunki offered to resign over the mangled Ingram I found in his archive yesterday, but instead I ordered him to knock off early and come and drink with me in the canteen. I don't like that the kid's my only sounding board for my paranoia, but he gave me those doubts to begin with. He's also the only one qualified to tell me if what I'm afraid of is even possible. I knew his team already had a zillion Ingrams in their brain bank, including my own. I made my joining the project conditional on the agreement not to emulate my archive for resurrection. Clearly they had that capacity anyway, over my objections. What if the rumour that Yunki heard was true, that had died near the end of the war? Was it so crazy to imagine that the transhumanist just booted up another copy of me? After editing my memories just to fill the gap, could I be Santiago 2.0? So that concludes part one of the note read through from Santiago on the Genesis ship. We will of course be continuing in part two with the conclusion to Santiago's story and we will continue with the rest of the Explorer note read throughs on the Genesis ship. So don't forget to subscribe if you're new here and you're enjoying the art content from myself. But until next time, I'm James from Complete Games and I'll see you.